Um, thanks for joining us today to close out our Earth Week with Matt Grokoff, our special guest. Matt and I actually met via a tour of his home, which <laughs> is kind of weird. But uh, he has America's oldest and Michigan's first net zero energy home. And articles about this home have been featured in USA Today and The Atlantic and numerous other publications. Matt is the founding principal of Thrive Net Zero Energy Consulting Collaborative and the co-founder of Mission Zero Fest. And he is an advocate and thought leader on net zero energy building and restorative design. So Matt, thanks for being here. Can you all hear me? This is great, because this is actually the first talk that I've got to do that year. <laughs> Happy first day of spring. It comes a little bit later here in Michigan. But, um, uh, you know, speaking of spring and temperature and comfort and everything else, we, we, we don't measure our lives in stuff, right? We measure our lives in, in, in love and happiness. But comfort is that tool that we use, that zone that we want to put ourselves into in order to provide us that space for, for love and happiness and joy and friendship and family and all those other wonderful things that we do measure our lives in. But about 10,000 years ago was the first time that we came off of the savanna, out from, literally from treetops, out of caves, places where we were trying to find shelter, and started building our own shelter from other things, only for about 10,000 years. Right? So originally we went around the campfires and we, uh, and we stayed warm. They wouldn't even sleep eight hours through the night. They would wake up in the middle of the night, dance around the fire to entertain themselves. Now we've really tried to capitalize ourselves with comfort as much as we possibly can. So we've got ourselves, now we're entertaining ourselves with the Harlem Shake, with uh, Ganyan style. We have, originally we're pooping out by the tree, now then out in the outhouse, then we brought in the chamber pot. Uh, but that obviously wasn't the real way to go, so we started using indoor toilets, indoor plumbing. So we have these things that are flushing 15 gallons of fresh water down the drain, but that's still not enough comfort because if you're the toilet train cat owner, you've got to uh, have one for your cat as well. Now, for you y'all grammarians out there, this is the, the ultimate convenience for the toilet train cat owner. Uh, I, I'm assuming they're talking about the cat, not the owner. But here, if you've got your own elephant, you've got to have a toilet for that too. It's not enough just for the indoor animals. We can't serve our own coffee anymore or cut our own hot dogs. This one here is my own favorite. This is really the symbol of, uh, of, the, of the end of times, as far as I'm concerned. This is the proof of the overcapitalization of comfort, right? I can't make this stuff up, it's real. You can look this up on, on Amazon. There's over 2,000 reviews of this product. The Hutzler 571B, I think B is for banana, but I'm not sure. Uh, 248 on Amazon, and these are real. These are, these are reviews. Here's one from uh, Miss Toledo. She raves, this uh, saved my marriage. <laughs> uh, what, what can I say about the 571B that hasn't already been said about the wheel, penicillin, or the iPhone? I, I, <laughs> this is, and, so, and we're now we're starting to see the consequences of some of this, what I call the overcapitalization of comfort. This is the number 350. This is parts per million of carbon dioxide in, in our atmosphere. This is what Bill McKibben calls the most important number in the world that everybody should know. And the reason he says that is because James Hansen determined that above this number, parts per million in the atmosphere, if we keep it above this level for, for a, 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 a significant period of time, we can't sustain the biosphere to which humans have adapted over these 10,000 years. Uh, we can't sustain wildlife uh, or any of the living things that adapted to this kind of climate. But this is the number that I think is the most important number, zero. That's zero carbon pollution going up into the atmosphere because this is the number that we can impact in our daily lives every day. This is the number we can impact at home. 350 is for the scientists. Zero carbon emissions out of your office place, from your automobiles, from your, from your homes. Completely decarbonizing our economy down to zero carbon going up into the atmosphere. That's our ultimate goal and that's something that we can impact every single day. Uh, James Hansen gave us that number 350. He says that stabilizing atmospheric CO2 and climate requires that CO2 emissions approach zero. Now this is from a scientific paper. They didn't say it's a suggestion. They said it's a requirement. And it's a whole lot easier to change the way we use energy than it is to change the laws of physics. This is a physical 
law, a requirement that we have to get to zero carbon emissions. So this is our house over here on the old west side in Ann Arbor. Uh, that, this picture was taken uh, uh, probably in about uh, 1912. Our house was built in 1901. Uh, since uh, we've done a little bit of work to the house, it's gotten a lot of attention. We were in USA Today. It was called one of the top green houses of 2010. Uh, the Atlantic called it sustainable perfection. I'm getting calls from around the country for people to, they, they call me the zero energy master. It sounds very dominating. I kind of like the term. <laughs> and uh, so I've spoken at the World Renewable Energy Forum at Greenbuild and Living Futures Conference next month and at Google. Uh, and people are saying, what did you do to this house? Why, how, how could you get this 112 year old house to net zero energy? And uh, it's a really simple story, and it goes back to 2006 when my wife and I were thinking it might be a really good time to buy a house, and the market is going crazy. If we buy a house now, imagine what it's going to be like in 2008. <laughs> and then we heard on the radio, and this was the true story, this is the catalyst, uh, we heard that Google was bringing a thousand new employees to town. And my wife called me, she said, did you just hear on NPR, Google is coming to town to bring a thousand employees, we've got to buy, buy a house now, there's all these people coming from California, they don't know what houses are worth. <laughs> so this is the house. We this is the house we bought. Now you pointed at the computer, not the screen. Uh, this was the house. This was our dream house, right? We ran by this thing on a July afternoon and said, that is the house we want to live in. It's got everything we could ever want. It's got a plywood front porch, asbestos siding, zero insulation in the entire house, except for a layer of newspaper dated in 1902. Uh, we had lead paint, which everybody wants. Uh, we had no operable windows, which was really fun. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, even though they weren't operable, and you can see some of the little sash locks here are missing, you could still stick a spatula or a screwdriver right through that hole. And there's plenty of air going through, so we weren't worried about suffocating in the house. Uh, we had carpet covering heart pine floors that were from trees that were harvested 112 years ago and were probably growing at the time Christopher Columbus sailed for the Americas. Uh, it's certainly worth uh, worth putting. Uh, carpet over. This was a refrigerator from 1989 inside the kitchen with the, uh, with the linoleum floors. This was the bathroom with the toilet that flushed five gallons every time. So we took this much waste and turned it into this much waste. And uh, my favorite part of that bathroom, though, is the pink towel curtains that were sewed together. Uh, and, and this house didn't have a shower at the time. This was the only bath. Uh, this was uh, one of only two rooms in the house that had running water in it when we bought it in 2006. I uh, did have genuine Formica tile. I few times made the mistake of saying it was fake. Uh, but no, it's real Formica. Uh, we, we had, the sink was flowing at, uh, at two or three gallons a minute, two and a half, three gallons a minute. This is the Mueller Climatrol furnace from 1957. That little white tag on there shows the date of installation and with some of uh, the inspections that were done over the years. Uh, this thing operated, it was about 40% efficiency. I mean, 60% of it was just donations to the utility company. And for the privilege of paying that $350 a month to the utility company to run this thing, we got to sleep with two down comforters, fully clothed in, uh, in sweatpants, sweatshirt, socks, and a buckwheat pillow heated up in the microwave and shoved down at the bottom of the bed. I am barely, barely comfortable at that. So we wanted to create a vision for what we wanted this house to be, because I was a little upset when my mom came into the house and, uh, and she didn't just get blown away right away when she saw this, the asbestos siding and the carpet on the floors. And I was like, so what do you think? Check out our new house. <laughs> really upset with my Jewish mother. And she's like, you know, what, nothing? You're not going to say a word about the house? It'll look nice when it's done. I'm like, what do you mean? It's beautiful. Look at so we, we did have a vision. Uh, Yogi Berra said that if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. And uh, there's a little gentleman in town you might have heard of, Ari Weinzweig who uh, owns Zingerman's Deli, a little uh, $45 million company. Uh, they talk a lot about vision. And he says, vision is not the how. Vision is the what. Right? And as Sir mix once said, that I like big what's and I cannot lie. We want the biggest what we can possibly find. Then we figure out how to do it. Uh, and it was one of the Googlers, either Larry Page or some of the other guys, who talks about 10 times versus the 10% gain. Right, so we wanted to go big. We wanted to go to this number here. We wanted zero carbon emissions out of a century-old house, and having no idea that it was impossible. But that's why we knew it was possible. Uh, this guy over here from another computer company, uh, he was asked if he had one wish, what would it be? And he didn't say, hey, I'd pick the next president of the United States, or I'd bring world peace, or I would uh, uh, 
I've come up with a vaccine for malaria, right? That's what the Gates Foundation does. He didn't say that. He said instead that he would reduce global emissions to zero. Because he recognized that if we don't get to that goal of zero carbon emissions, there's no use in trying to cure diseases or elect the presidents. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of folks uh, jumping on board. This is a small company out of, uh, out of uh, Arkansas, uh, sorry, out, uh, out in California, and the U.S. Army all have these mission zero goals of getting to zero carbon emissions from their company, and then some, ultimately making them restorative companies. So we figured if Walmart could do it, then we could too. So we hired as cheap as labor as we possibly could um, ourselves. And uh, we targeted our own mission zero, making the house 100% harvesting our own energy, harvesting all of our own water, creating zero waste, and then not only eliminating the harm we're causing to the community uh, and to the environment around the home, but actually restoring the environment around the home and actually seeing what we can do to make this a restorative home. And we're on that path towards it now. Because we have the ideal as the indicator of success. And this is this is the ideal. That's my daughter, Jean. Uh, she's four years old now. She's the first generation that will never know what it's like to grow up in a carbon polluting home. She has no idea. Because this is the home that she's getting to grow up. This is a house in, uh, in uh, 1913. This is Philip and Elizabeth Gauss. Uh, we bought the house from Gert uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 2006. So we're really the second family to own this house. Uh, this is the backyard. You can see the cold chimney <coughs> covered with soot and some of the grapevines they used uh, later during Prohibition. And this is 7th Street. These are the hydrangeas that are still on the side of our house. Uh, this is Grizzly Peak Brewing Company over the corner of Washington and Ashley Street. Uh, it was at, just shortly after this photograph was taken, it became the Philip Gauss Saloon. So he would walk out the front door to serve beer to customers uh, over uh, 100 years ago uh, to the same place that we now go to get beer and french fries. But what makes this photograph unique and the reason it was taken was this was the day where the Gauss family didn't have to burn things themselves for their own energy. They could flip a light switch and they would get electricity delivered to their house with carbon burning somewhere else that they no longer had to see. First time in human history that this had ever happened as soon as we started remotely supplying electricity to homes. So Wendell Berry says, when going back makes sense, we move forward. So we really want to take a look back at what was done right back in the day. Now, uh, historic preservationists love to say that old buildings are the greenest buildings around. And there's some truth to that. They certainly did recognize the patterns of nature. And you could look at our backyard. This, again, this is uh, 1915. That's Robert again uh, in our backyard. And you can see some of the things that were, this house was net zero water uh, when, when the Gausses lived in it. This is the, the cistern cap over here. Uh, over to the far right, you can see the, the well water where they bring in a little fresh water that they needed for the house to fill up the bathtub or to cook with. Uh, all the rainwater fell off of the roof into the cistern that was used for the gardens, the vegetable gardens in the backyard, so a good percentage of their food. Up until the 1940s, about 40% of produce in America was grown in people's yards. Back in the back there, there were uh, chicken coops. In the 1950s, they, uh, they started making chickens illegal. Um, they're legal again now. We have a few in our backyard. Uh, then there was a doghouse back there for Fido. Now, Fido's job was to guard the chickens from the foxes and things that ran around the old west side of Ann Arbor. The foxes are long gone, but they did have uh, the, the, uh, the composting toilet, also known as the outhouse. So a couple of these things are wonderful to go back to. Natural ventilation, uh, harvesting our food from our own property, capturing our water, things like that. And certainly composting toilets, but uh, that's probably not the best design. I think we could probably do better than that. Now, but that these houses were perfect. It's really kind of the myth of the noble house. Because the Gausses were burning about 1,200 pounds of coal to cook and heat with every single month. That's about 100 pounds of ash alone. That's not uh, a way we're going to go back to heating or cooking. Our sewers, our, our streams, and our rivers were turned to, to sewers. They were so polluted with chemicals and everything else from all the industrial processes that were going on in Ann Arbor. Heavy metals, sewage, you name it, was going straight into the creeks. 
that in the 1930s we decided, hey, we have the engineering capability of just turning these natural services into actual sewers. And now they're buried in a concrete pipe. And throughout Ann Arbor, just about every one of us every day walks across one of these creeks without ever knowing that it's ever existed. And one of them runs right next door to our house. This is the Allen Creek uh, as it goes underneath Washington Street right by the YMCA. Uh, it's buried under a pipe. Before the Gausses, in the 1700s, early 1800s, the primary fuel for cooking and heating was wood. Uh, now, humans are the only species on Earth that have ever burned anything for our own comfort and survival. So wood was plentiful. In 1799, uh, they wrote that Michigan had inexhaustible heart pine forests. Inexhaustible. No way you could possibly use it all. The canopy of the trees was so thick and dense that they said a squirrel could hop across the canopy from the upper peninsula of Michigan all the way down to northern Florida without ever touching the ground. That's how thick the forests of the east coast of the United States were. But by 1890, uh, th that's a, the, this is about how much wood each house was burning at the time, uh, 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 15 to 20 cords of wood. So that's, that's, to give you an idea, that's four feet wide, 16 feet high up to the top of these ceilings, and the entire width of this, of this hall here. Every single home was burning that just to cook and heat with. So by 1890, this was Hermanville, Michigan. We had exhausted 95% of all of the forest cover in the state of Michigan in less than 100 years. That was before the population of the world had hit one billion people. So we can't go back to, uh, I, just, I was buying a farmer's market, somebody was selling kale, and this guy with dreadlocks said to me, hey, you know, well, we could just go back to living in yurts. And I'm like, well, how are you going to heat 130 million yurts in the US? Uh, that's not really a sustainable solution either. We can do better than that. Lighting. Every neighborhood, every city had a place where you can go in and buy any kind of liquid that burned, really. You had lard oil, camphor, kerosene, whale oil. If it was liquid and it burned, they sold it. And this is how we lit our homes. Now, and if, I, I think it's coming up pretty soon, is uh, this uh, thing called Earth Hour. Right? Earth Hour is where around the globe we want to bring awareness to the amount of electricity we use. And so they have everyone just turn off their lights. They turn off the lights that, light, that illuminate the Eiffel Tower, the, the uh, uh, the Empire State Building in New York, and uh, everyone gets together and has these really intimate meals. We all light candles to put focus on the attention of how much uh, energy we're using. So some enterprising young graduate student decided, well, how much CO2 comes out of a paraffin candle? Can we go back away from the light bulb to the paraffin candle to light our way at night? And he figured out that the paraffin candle uses 10 times the amount of CO2 of an incandescent light bulb per lumen. So we're not going back to that either. And this is what, but this is what our electric lights look like at night from space. Um, somebody said once, oh, it looks like the planet's on fire. And in a way, it is, because we're actually digging up these hundreds of millions of years of stored solar energy and burning them for electricity and setting all the particulate matter and all that carbon that was stored in the ground up into the atmosphere, and that number rises every single day. So here's the challenge. We've got 130 million existing homes in America already here. So California has said that, look, if we're going to do this, then all new homes from now on, starting about the 2020 energy code, they have to be net zero energy. And that's incredibly ambitious, and it's necessary. It's a wonderful thing they're doing. But if you really think about it, if all new homes and all new buildings are net zero energy, they don't emit a single bit of carbon pollution for their entire life, starting this afternoon, everything new, zero emissions, how much does that lower our current carbon output? And the answer is zero. We have to do something with the existing building stuff. So is that really possible? Well, Emory Lovin says if it exists, it must be possible. So let me show you what exists. These are the numbers from our house. Uh, slide's a little bit outdated. This is from October 
2011 through 2012. So this is a year's worth of energy data for our house. On the roof of our house, we produced 95 kilowatt hours of solar. We used about 7,500 kilowatts, and we put 2,000 kilowatts back onto the grid that we weren't even using. This is what a typical energy bill looks like in our house, but minus 88 bucks a month, <laughs> give or take. Sometimes it's more than that, sometimes it's in the hundreds, sometimes it's a little bit less than that. So we did some math, and we figured that over 30 years, the life of our mortgage, people go into the house, they know exactly how much taxes they're gonna pay, they know how much uh, the mortgage is gonna be, they'll even give you a chart when you get your loan. What are you gonna spend over 30 years with all of that interest? But nobody says, what am I gonna spend over 30 years to run this house? And this is the number that we came up with, $283,000 a shift in energy costs for us over, the, over 30 years. Now in fairness, that's at 7% energy inflation. And the coal industry says, well, it's only gonna be 4.3%. So if we split the difference, we're still talking about $234,000 energy swing for us. So Nitzer Energy has gotten the financial thumbs up. But if the coal industry is right, and they'll say, well, you look, that's not fair to say 7% because you know, we have no idea what the price of energy is going to be like in the future. And that's exactly the point. Uh, if there's no commodity trader on the planet, not the best ones out there, that will know that in 20 minutes at the close of the commodity exchange today, how much the raw cost of coal or petroleum or natural gas is gonna be. They don't know it today, tomorrow, five days from now, no idea. They might get an approximation, but they'll never get the number right. But any five-year-old can tell you exactly what the raw cost of solar energy or wind energy is going to be 10,000 years from now. The only difference in cost is the cost of building the power plant. So, here's how you do it. It's a pretty simple formula. You lose less, you use less, and then you produce all the energy that you need. And you, what you do is you really try to optimize your comfort. Because when we first moved in, and, so, and people started writing about our house and the work we were doing, everyone immediately assumed, oh, well, clearly, you know, they're, they're hippies bathing in their pasta water. This is, uh... <laughs> but as it turns out, we invite over a thousand people a year come through our house, and we show them we have all the same appliances that everybody else has. Uh, the, the difference is that they're, they're always the most efficient appliances and we control them. So right now, our home, I can tell you without even looking, and I have a little app for that, uh, exactly how much energy we're using. It's probably less than 200 watts right now, less than, something than a few of these light bulbs in this room. Our entire house is operating off of that right now because nobody's home. Uh, that little thing over there in the corner, that is the one old Thing that we still have. That was our, my clock radio that I bought in law school in 1992. And just plugging that in, doing a little math on it, I realized that actually uses more energy throughout the year than the TV set up on the upper right corner. And so it's not about sacrificing, saying you can't watch Gamer Style on your YouTube on your smart TV anymore. Uh, you've got to replace the little clock radios and you've got to make everything else more efficient. You'll get better stuff, a little bit more comfortable, and you control them to where they're only using electricity when they're delivering you a service. And that's the real challenge. Lighting, you can get the most efficient light bulbs in the world, but the best thing you do is harvest daylight for free. It's better lighting, and, uh, and there's not much to it. Uh, our house is an old house, so it was built to harvest as much natural daylight as possible without light bulbs. Thermostats, the world is changing. A couple of guys left Apple. The guys, in fact, from the team who uh, uh, created the iPod and the iPhone left Apple. That was the time to sell your Apple stock. And, uh, and so they, they don't want to make toys anymore. So they made that product over on the, le on the right side. That's the Nest. And actually, Google is a huge investor in the Nest. Uh, because they realize that this, this little product with an algorithm that knows the outdoor temperature, the indoor temperature, humidity, indoor and outdoors, and it can optimize exactly when you need it to be the temperature that you need it. So at 7 o'clock, where your programmable thermostat kicks up to 70 degrees and starts to work, this one will have it at 70 degrees. Because at 4 in the morning, it knows it's 20 degrees outside. I need to turn on the, I need to turn on the heat right now. And at 7 o'clock, it's going to be exactly the temperature you want it to be. So you've optimized your comfort, but you've used as little energy as possible. Because the next day, when it's 30 degrees, just 5 degrees warmer, it might kick on 15 minutes later, because it knows that. It's going to know exactly what time to kick on to keep you optimally comfortable. 
So these little tiny devices that are two, 250 bucks, you know, can save huge amounts of energy. You can imagine what happens when you put these into 130 million homes. Uh, lighting, if there's a light bulb on in an unoccupied room, you're paying 100% of the cost, you're getting zero benefit. Who does that? You know, that's like getting, leasing a car that you never get to use. So uh, California requires all new homes to have occupancy sensors and all the lights. And every switch in our home has a sensor on it. Uh, our lives are so much easier because of it. We don't have to worry about turning lights off when we go out of the kitchen carrying loads of stuff or going down to the basement with a load of laundry. Uh, they'll turn off for us, and I don't have to teach my four-year-old, go back and turn off the lights. She knows how to turn off the lights, but if she doesn't, that's okay. They're gonna turn off by themselves. The light bulbs that we put in, we make sure are the most efficient ones uh, available. The incandescent light won't even talk about anymore because it's infinitely more expensive than the other two options. The one in the middle is actually what I call the eight-track cassette of lighting because that thing's gonna be gone within a couple of years. On the right side, that's already the most affordable light bulb on the planet. Because over the life cycle of that light bulb, although it costs 15 bucks, the energy you're gonna spend on it, uh, and it's gonna last you uh, in a home, over 20, 25 years, a single light bulb, it ends up being the cheapest bulb on the planet. And you can get them at Home Depot, Lowe's, any store right now, and the prices are coming down every day. But the biggest place that we're losing energy, we're really getting screwed, is in the shower. Now, I know what you're thinking, you shouldn't be using electricity in the shower anyway, but you, you are. Uh, that's all hot water in there. So by replacing shower heads with the most optimized water sense certified, uh, really efficient shower heads, like they're using Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, where instead of using two and a half gallons a minute, they're using one and a half gallons a minute of water, a family of four is now saving 16,000 gallons of hot water just by changing a little $40 device. Uh, and, uh, and, that's all, and that's all energy. So the um, appliances in the house. Uh, right now, that's actually the stove we have. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be changing this out very quickly in the next couple of weeks. That gas stove operates at 45% efficiency. It's got three pilot lights on it that actually cost us more energy than cooking throughout the year. It's from 1969. It's totally badass. It looks really cool. But if we replace it with this even badasser looking um, unit, wait a minute, oh my god, it's gone. No, it's still there. Uh, uh, this is an induction cooktop. Uh, sadly, this, is only, this one model is only available in the UK right now. But the induction cooktop operates at 95% efficiency and will use electricity without burning any carbon at all. Uh, then we uh, upgrade the water tanks. We get the most efficient water tanks. And now that we're all, all electric family, Ford decided, hey, we're going to roll out our all electric vehicle. We're going to introduce the all American family. They put my wife and I uh, in the centerfold. And no jokes about being a centerfold. That's my daughter you're talking about. Uh, but uh, uh, now, now Ford's going to be a little upset with the next photograph because uh, that's the Chevy Bolt that we got a few months later. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we're using some of that excess energy to dump into the bolt. That little where that red arrow is, that's our, uh, our electric charging station. And it's uh, right at that moment, it's drawing power directly off of the solar panels on the roof and uh, filling up with tanks of sunshine right into the car. So then we, uh, we restored all of our own windows. We tightened them up as much as possible. We did apply for historic preservation tax credits, which meant we had to keep the historic integrity of the house. It was not a gut rehab. Um, we only put R13 in the walls, and for, uh, for the non-building geeks, that's not much. It's not even what current code is, but that's what could fit into the wall. So we just put dense packed cellulose into the wall. We put uh, a, a minimal insulation, actually, for, uh, by modern standards, uh, into the attic. But we made sure the attic was sealed really well, so we got little air leakage. And then, because the house became so tight with the new insulated windows that we were able to weather strip the old windows, and restore the old ones rather than replacing them with new materials. The house was so tight that we actually went below the standards where you required to have mechanical ventilation when the windows are closed. So in the attic, we also have an energy recovery ventilator. Then uh, in the ground, we dug three, uh, three wells, which you do a heat exchange for our geothermal system, and we have the most efficient heating and cooling system on the planet. Uh, and then we put uh, a bunch of solar panels on the roof, and we uh, powered the uh, of nuclear power, but we made sure we put the nuclear power plant 93 million miles away, and as Bill McDonough said, we powered it wirelessly. So let's go back to some of this, this math that we started with at the beginning. Um, 290, that's the parts per million in the atmosphere 
for 800,000 years of human history until about 1751, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And just about that time, when we start discovering coal and steam engines and everything else, uh, that number starts to tick up. It starts to go above 290 parts per million for the first time in over 800,000 years. This is the number, again, that James Hansen says we need to stay under if we're going to stabilize the planet. This is the number where we hit yesterday, 398 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And they're concerned that it will probably hit 400 by May of this year. That correlates to a one degree global temperature average Celsius uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So in 100 years, we've raised the global temperature on average about one degree. It doesn't sound like much, but to put that in perspective, Negative one degree Celsius gave us the ice age. So negative one degree gives us the ice age. And this is what positive one degree gives us. PricewaterhouseCoopers is a, a consulting firm out of the UK. Uh, Again, not a bunch of hippies basing their, in their pasta of water, a bunch of conservative suited business folks who are trying to provide the best data they can to their clients about what they need to be looking for moving forward and what they need to expect and, uh, and how they need to change the way they do business. And so the numbers they looked at, they said, look, if we're really going to decarbonize and stay below 450 parts per million, which they say is really kind of the cap, we should be able to below 350, but let's stay at least below 450 we're headed there, that we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 5.1% every single year through the year 2050. Now sadly, from uh, 2010 to 2011, we were only doing that by about 0.7% uh, decline each year that we're reducing our carbon intensity. So they did a little study and they just assumed, all right, let's say, let's say we just do 1.6% reduction of carbon intensity every single year. Where will we be by the year 2050? And that's the number they came up with. That's my daughter, Jane. She'll be 42. Little baby Andrew, who you just saw in the back, will be 37. We know how to do the right thing. We know what is possible. Google is doing it. The US Army is doing it. Even Walmart is doing it. But we don't have a lot of time to get there. We've got to get this right. The margin for error here is slim. Bill Bryson, in his latest book, At Home, said that the greatest possible irony would be that in our endless quest to fill our lives with comfort and happiness, that we created a world that had neither. But I really think that's it's a false choice. It's not a choice between comfort and happiness or decarbonization. Because the reality is, is that when we do these things, we really decide, what are the things that make us happy? Love, friendship, family, growing your own food, the satisfaction of eating a tomato off the vine riding your bike, being outdoors, picnicking. These little things, if we really pay attention to those things, rather than just overconsumption and waste, those are the things that truly make us happy, and that's the path that we need to be on. Bloomberg did a little calculation, realizing that, that uh, there's enough rooftops in America, just on residential homes, to power all of our current electricity needs with no further reduction no efficiency gains. There's enough rooftop space to give us all the electricity that we need. That's just electricity. Here's a, here's a project I'm working on up in Traverse City. Uh, that's a Habitat for Humanity project. Affordable housing. Ten homes that will be net zero energy. So we're proving across the country that net zero houses and net zero buildings are available and possible in every single size, in every single climate, and in every single price range. This is another home here in Ann Arbor that we're working on, a 1949 ranch house. 
uh, that will be net zero energy. This is a building in San Francisco, the Exploratorium Science Museum. They've just restored an old pier down by the wharf that is 300,000 square feet and will be net zero energy. And then we're taking our home even one step further and working with students at the University of Michigan Blue Lab to have the house certified uh, as part of the Living Buildings Challenge, which will mean that the house will be able to harvest all of its own water, all of its own energy, <coughs> have zero waste, and be restorative to the community. And there's a building out in Seattle that was just moved into. This is the Bullet Center office building, over 50,000 square feet. Again, harvest all of its own energy, water, and manage all of its own waste. And these are buildings that are getting more comfortable and restorative. And the exciting thing is, is that if we can do this right here in Michigan, then anybody can do it. And if anybody can do it, that means everybody can do it. And that includes you. So thanks for having me. Just know that the longer you take for questions, the less time I have to get out to uh, Lake Michigan, Sam. <coughs> <Salem>. But <laughs> no, I'm so yeah. Yeah. So um, a lot of the you talked about enough rooftops to power America. <laughs> Western European countries, maybe over like the last decade, there have been a lot of subsidies to do retrofits of various types, commercial and residential facilities, with solar energy and things like that. Have you ever? Uh, I mean, have you have you kind of is there any way of calculating how impactful that's been, how beneficial that's been, and whether whether that model works here? Like, how much how much do you know about how, how feasible it is to make the rooftops, you know? Power yeah. Power? Well, one of the things they've done in Germany is that they really democratized the grid. As free as we are in this country, we, we don't get to own our own energy. Um, we have, uh, because, you know, a century ago, we decided that whoever was going to make that grid it was going to be at great expense, so just like the railroads, we gave them monopolies and we've been trying to figure out how to manage that ever since. So what we have is this really old, outdated grid system of electricity that's like a Christmas tree. If one part goes out, you, know, you lose the entire eastern seaboard like we did a few years ago. Um, if Google wanted to use all of this roof space and, uh, and sell the energy to some of the other floors or the building next door, it wouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, so uh, the utility company owns the energy. If you put excess onto it, they get it. Uh, we were lucky enough to get into a program that, uh, that was around just for a couple of years where DTE was going to buy our solar energy, uh, any excess that we use. So we're benefiting greatly financially, and that's what's available in, uh, in Germany. Uh, there was a day this past summer, last year, where uh, Germany, over half of the energy uh, uh, during this day was produced by renewable energy. They have a goal to take the entire nation to uh, zero carbon emissions to be uh, uh, powered completely by renewable energy, not including nuclear, by the year 2030. So they want to decommission all of their nuclear plants by 2030, and that's a really ambitious goal. But what's happening is, so companies like, you know, like Google and the Army and, uh, and, uh, and Walmart uh, in Germany have really bought into this idea all of a sudden, there's just extraordinary amount of innovation, um, profit that's coming from it, savings that, that, that is really sparking all kinds of imagination. Um, and people who work for companies that are involved in that report are just being happy about it. They actually show up to work more. So, um, uh, so it certainly is possible here. And states here that have been the most progressive on it, uh, places like California, New Jersey, Ohio, um, have been really aggressive with this stuff, are getting a lot of solar. Uh, and uh, uh, Germany, I forgot what the percentage is, but I was just reading this yesterday. And I, th I believe it's, uh, and I think it's actually almost half of the energy is actually owned by individuals and farmers. So that, that's an extraordinary model. And when that happens, then you can really do it. And the other thing is really to put a price on carbon. And there has to be a, because right now, the price we're paying doesn't get onto the accounting sheet. So that's all externalized, and we have to internalize those costs and pay for what that really costs. Yeah, my dad is like, he hates solar energy for some reason. And well, and his, <laughs> his argument is always that whenever he like 
reads about these solar cells that they produce they, they cost more energy to produce than they get during their lifetime. Have you done the calculation and Yeah, it's not true. No. Yeah, it's not even worth answering. There, it's, it's just not true. That that's just uh, I, I honestly I don't know what the motives are for for that for that world of, of, of people who are trying to debunk these technologies that are proven. Um, uh, there are life cycle assessments on all of this stuff, and uh, uh, and certainly there's different processes. Some manufacturers are more efficient than others. And there's actually a standard now in California where this uh, uh, nonprofit group is rating uh, uh, solar panels from cradle to grave. Uh, of how, uh, you know, what kind of chemicals they use, what their processes are, how much energy are, is used to make them, and so on. You can use solar energy to make solar panels, so uh, it's just it's just silly. Um, so how do we get a solar roof if we want one? Uh, <laughs> I, and honestly, it's, it's tough in Michigan unless you have the upfront capital to do it. Uh, over time, it will absolutely pay itself back. There's no question about that. Um, but when the, uh, when the costs are unequalized and if you're able to make more energy than you can use, there's no feed-in tariff in Michigan. There's no, uh, there's no real incentives uh, for it to, um, uh, uh, to pay for itself um, in the short term. So, uh, but it is possible. In fact, um, uh, oh, who was I just talked to earlier? They're getting some solar panels in the next, but this week actually. Um, so, but you can email me and I'll give you the names of some solar companies right here in the area. So there's definitely plenty, I don't want to discourage you because there's plenty of homes that are doing it now and there are ways of doing it. You can actually be creative and sell your renewable energy credits in other states and all this other stuff. So it's, uh, right. yeah, it's getting crazy. And the price of solar is dropping like computers. I mean, it's like, it's the same, it's the same curve actually. Whereas ours was about, I think it was $7 a watt, it's down to $3 a watt. Uh, since we put our panels on. So, significant reduction. What was the total cost of everything you've done? And how much of that was subsidized by like, DT programs at the time? Or like, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, well, actually, the only thing that was really subsidized was the solar. Uh, we got 30% federal tax credit. Uh, we got uh, uh, about $19,000 back on the solar rate from DTE up front. So that went directly to the installer. Uh, and then we get renewable energy credits on the back end. So the solar array itself ended up being out of pocket after all those reductions, only about $15,000. So while our good friends bought a, uh, a, a you know, car about the same time we were installing the solar panels, five years later they have a used car and we have free energy for life. Um, and now we have a bolt too, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the whole rehab itself, um, it was uh, including the incentives for the solar was uh, $105,000 because we did a lot of the work ourselves. So that included an electrician, painters to restore the outside of the house, uh, plumbing, uh, new electric, uh, you know, the solar, the geothermal was uh, was a, was big one. But when we put the geothermal in, there was no, there was it wasn't even a tax incentive for that. But there was still enough of a payback for us because uh, we knew we were going to stay in the house. That it, it was it was going to be the most efficient and comfortable unit that we could have. Uh, and then we did get a, uh, uh, a uh, historic preservation tax credit, which hopefully will come in the mail this next week, um, for about a little over twenty thousand dollars. So that that's the most significant thing we've gotten was we were rewarded for restoring a historic house. I could do a whole hour lecture on that one though because we almost didn't get it because of some... yeah. <laughs> Can I ask somewhat of a follow-up question to that? Is just like it seems like said the short-term costs are a significant barrier to something that is obviously going to pay for itself over you know, yeah. the long run. I guess, what are your thoughts on just like models that you think work well? And I know there's been like a lot of things in the news about like subsidies to solar companies that are no longer, yeah. Or, like, I don't know, yeah. you know, I'm just trying to think about like, it seems like there would be some sort of way that somebody who had a lot of capital could make this a very profitable program. Yeah. To just yeah. like subsidize and they, hey, if you're gonna and, and they are. There's solar leasing programs that are very successful in other states where they they own the solar panels and they're leasing you the panels. So that way they get around who owns the energy. They're not selling you the energy, they're just selling you the power plant. They're not even selling you the power plant. They own the power plant on your roof. So you lease it back from them and your payments each month are lower than what you would be paying if you bought electricity from the utility company. So that's one model. 
Um, there's, uh, you know, but, but all of this really has to change dramatically. Like we can't just keep, you know, throwing money at this company or that company and hoping it works. We really have to put a price. The reason solar is at a disadvantage is because the other forms of fossil fuels are artificially cheap. Right. Because we don't pay for the cost of that. You don't see the cost of oil spills in the, in the Kalamazoo River or in the Gulf of Mexico. You don't see the cost of the invisible carbon dioxide and methane and everything else that goes up into the atmosphere. Nobody pays that. That's just the tragedy of the commons. So if we actually calculate those costs and see what they really are, uh, then then all of a sudden, you know, how we create our energy uh, really changes. And so that's why Germany is really, I think, the best model we've got so far for it. And uh, and they're on target. They'll they'll do it by 2030. And we could all do it if we have the political will. So anybody else? All right, thanks, y'all.